Today we're talking about a rapper with a very small catalog, but despite this, his music is still respected. His music caught the attention of industry giants like Jay-Z and Diddy. And for a moment in time, Jay was briefly the object of a bidding war before he decided to sign with Rock Nation. Despite his seemingly guaranteed success, Jay's head was not always in the music and his music got pushed back time and time again. Also, despite his very sluggish movement in the industry, Jay has been involved in quite a few controversies, some of which include 50 Cent, Kendrick, Absol, Eminem, and Joe Budden. Also, let's not forget that Jay Electronica was once involved with a Rothschild. Like how does a guy with no album and no real presence in the industry go from dropping a mixtape to dating someone who's practically royalty? Today we're going to discuss everything that Jay was up to when he was pushing back his album. We're going to discuss his beefs, his rise to the top, and we're going to discuss if he was truly on the path to greatness. Let's begin. What up guys, Ali here and welcome to Ali Talks Music. Add me on Instagram at Ali Talks Music as well. And don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. Now let's get into the video. Jay Electronica was born around 1976 and was raised in New Orleans. From a young age, Jay always aspired to be a rapper and when he was about 10, he began working on his flow and said that he was inspired by LL Cool J. Additionally, he also drew inspiration from Ra Kim and other New Orleans hometown heroes like Soldier Slim. By the time he was 19 years old, Jay decided to leave New Orleans after the murder of his best friend. And Jay talks about this more in depth in his mixtape on a skit called Departure. <sighs> Many got killed, his wig got built in the Cali, yo. During this time period, Jay was living a very nomadic lifestyle, migrating between Atlanta, New York, Detroit, and Baltimore, as well as other cities. Now, while Jay was in Atlanta, he managed to get a job in a kitchen at Morris Brown College. However, he was not making enough money to pay the rent. They didn't have a Covenant house in Atlanta, so I ended up homeless. Things got so bad for Jay Electronica that he would sleep in a park, a train station, or basically any place that provided him safety. I remember having this overwhelming fear of, how is my life going to turn out? He then says, then, I realized that I was becoming a man. After spending time in Atlanta, he bounced around to New York, Denver, Dallas, Washington DC, Baltimore, and Philadelphia. And in every city he was in, he made sure to absorb the culture and take part in the hip hop scene. Eventually, he moved out to Detroit, where he worked with producer Jay Dilla and D12's own con artist, also known as Mr. Porter. I met Dilla in Detroit um, through Denon Porter, Mr. Porter from D12. He's, he, he's probably most known as that, but he's a producer. Uh, and he, he's, he's, done, he's worked with a lot of people. But, but anyway, yeah, yeah. Uh, him and a brother of mine, Johnny and Mike Chavaria, they introduced me to Dilla. They were building his studio at the time. I think he had just signed, what, what MCA had gave him a deal or something. They gave him like $300,000 to build a studio for because he wanted to work at, in Detroit. He didn't want to leave. Uh, so I met him during that time period when he was building his studio. And, you know, I started, I started doing some stuff on his music. You know, we, ne we, never, we never actually had a chance to work together because, you know, I, I left Detroit. And then at the time when we were supposed to start working, you know, he, had, he got ill and he passed away. Mm -hmm. But... You know, that's that's how I met him. But I don't. But you still have you have tracks that. You oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Over I got. Beats and I, stuff I, like I got. We we got. I got. I got like a thousand Dilla beats. <laughs> like, like oh. we. I, 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 I like. I like. I like. Dilla's music. Are y'all are y'all y'all familiar with Jay Dilla? Yeah. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dilla, Dilla. He's amazing. You know what I'm saying. Now, before getting to Detroit, he dropped a mixtape called The Awakening. It managed to get him some buzz, but it was his time in Detroit that really formed the rapper that we know today. Then out of nowhere, around 2004, Jay Electronica begins dating Erica Badu. And you know what people say about Erica Badu? Once you look in her eyes, it's over. Plenty of high profile rappers have fallen victim to Miss Erica Badu. We're talking Common, Andre 3000, 
Jay himself. And these are names that just popped in my head. So yeah, Erica Badu has quite the reputation for hooking up with high profile rappers and having babies with them. So yeah, in 2004, Erica Badu and Jay Electronica became a thing. And it was also during this time that Jay dropped songs on MySpace. During this year, he dropped songs like Retro Electro and Something to Hold On To, displaying both his lyrical skills and his ability to pay attention to what's going on in the public and putting that in the music. Somebody stop me, Lord, I'm on fire. Sucker MCs better call me sire. He also dropped songs like So What You Saying and Girlfriend, which contributed to his growing reputation. It seems like Jay Electronica was on fire at this point because the source featured them in their magazine in the unsigned hype column. So while Jay was not a big name yet, he was earning his stripes and beginning to get recognized by the public. Now just as Jay was gaining recognition from the public and other major platforms, he was also gaining recognition from his significant other, Erica Badu. In 2005, Erica Badu began her own record label, one called Control Freak. My new label Control Freak seeks to show artists how to run their own labels. We want to free both the slaves and the slave masters. Now you know what happens when you start to date someone and then all of a sudden you can't stop thinking about them. They're in your mind all the time. You want to call, you want to text, you want to be with them all the time. You know, then after spending more and more time with them, you're like, I like her or I like him. I like her so much that I want to make her life better. This is exactly what happened between Erica Badu and Jay Electronica. Erica Badu cared about Jay Electronica so much that she began her label Control Freak specifically to sign Jay Electronica. Jay is the reason I wanted to do the label. He's an incredible poet, an incredible artist, and a peculiarly intellectual MC. So Jay was the first act to sign to Erica Badu's label. Erica was simply looking out for her man and in the process, she discovered a very lucrative business idea. Just heard Erica's album, and I was surprised to not see a feature from you on it. Do you guys purposely try to keep personal and, and music separate? I mean, we got we, we do things. We collect. We we, we we bounce ideas off each other. You know, we got little pieces of music that we done done together. Ideas that we shoot around. You know what I'm saying? But that's soon to come. You know what I'm saying? Like we, at the same time, I know I know that too. That like if. If, 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 if me and Erica did something, people gonna put the magnifying glass on that, you know what I'm saying? So, we, you know, we'd we rather it happen naturally than to force it just because, you know what I'm saying? Like, just because my dad is Steven Spielberg, I'm gonna make a movie with my dad, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? But it's, be, it's better for a good movie to come, you know what I'm saying, than, than to just force one because of a circumstance. Now, usually I would say something like, what a lucky guy. You know, Erica didn't have to do that, but I think she was doing whatever she could to support her man. However, I've learned firsthand that once a woman feels like she owns you, it's over, bruh. After a while, she begins to lose respect, begins to see you as lesser than, and before long, she's kicking you to the curb. So yeah, as far as business goes, Jay made the right move to sign to Erica Badu. Erica was already a well-known artist with connections, but on a relationship level, Jay might have lost a few points when he signed to his girl. You just back me up. You, you, you just back don't make, me embarrass you on, don't make me embarrass you on this live, Erica. Just back me up and say yes to that on me, nigga. Ain't nothing going on but the rent. Hmm. You don't even pay no damn rent. You own your house. <laughs> hmm. Y'all got your seatbelts on? No. Can I borrow $2,000? Seatbelts, please. Sure. I'll pay pal you right now. Put seatbelt on. TJ need, need, TJ, need a new, TJ need new wheels on his motorcycle. <laughs> I got you, TJ. What look, is here you go right here, look, look, look. He about to fuck his marriage up messing with all these white girls. <laughs> what else y'all want? What else can I do? How much for sex? Ain't no how much for sex. Erica, don't make me mad. I'm about to hang up. Don't make me mad. Oh, because you think you went to Hawaii and now you think your skin is pretty. You ugly. <laughs> Get your ugly ass off my goddamn camera. How I hang this shit up? Now, 2006 was a very slow year for Jay, but around 2007, things began to pick up. In this year, he dropped the classic mixtape, Act 1, Eternal Sunshine, The Pledge. Now, what made this mixtape so special is that it was not like other albums. First of all, the album had no drums, and when I listen to hip hop, I can't wait for the drums to kick in. So the fact that Jay Electronica pulled this off 
It's amazing. So you can fit in with the clothes minded in the city and to get clothes lined in the it in. I can care less about a plaque in the bit in to get pumped on TV by my friends. Secondly, the mixtape was not broken down into individual songs. It was rather a 15 minute experience consisting of one continuous track made up of five songs. Interestingly enough, each song was sampled from the soundtrack Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. They also covered a range of themes from hip hop to Islam and to UFOs. Erika Badu also made an appearance on the project. So did Just Blaze. And he earned a lot of respect from industry giants like Nas and Jay. Uh, we just interviewed Jay Electronica at Pay Dues and he, he had some great things to, to say about you. Is there any chance that you guys are, are gonna hop on a collaboration project or, or maybe just some songs? Or? Yeah, you know Jay Electronica is definitely one of the guys that's getting ready to come out there and shake it up. I worked with him before, plan to work with him a lot more. At this point, Jay's career was climbing. He was rising as a star. And as he rose, he began to notice one thing. The fans kept wanting more music. So, he tooled together another 12-track collection of songs from his 2004 Detroit days called The Style Wars EP. In 2008, he kept dropping more music and dropped the compilation album Attack of the Clones and he also joined the Rock the Bells tour that year. Now in that same year, Nas dropped his album called Untitled. It debuted at number one on the Billboard 200 and sold about 187,000 copies in its first week. Now if you look at the track list, there are probably about 15 songs on the project, but one of them, called Queens Get the Money, was produced by Jay Electronica. Hey yo, Queens get the money, niggas still screaming paper chasing, but presidential candidates is planning wars with other nations. As the story goes, Nas was so inspired by Jay Electronica's sound that he wanted Jay to produce the entire untitled album for him. Now clearly that did not work out, but Nas and Jay were still able to put things together for the song Queens Get The Money. Now because Jay and Nas were strongly affiliated at this point, people assumed that Jay was writing for Nas. And honestly, when I heard these rumors, I was like, no way. Like if I heard Nas had a ghostwriter, I think I would stop listening to hip hop. Luckily, when these rumors came out, Jay Electronica was one of the first people to deny these rumors. Actually, we were, we were uh, at Electric Lady Studios. I was visiting Erica. She was uh, working on uh, New America and he was working on his album. And Erica and uh, Khalees, they know each other. They were saying peace or whatever. So when he was getting leave, I was like, well, I'm gonna get Nas. I had to do My World record. I have the record called My World, which is a Nas tribute. In the studio, when we were getting ready to leave, I gave him a CD. Take this and listen to it, it's a gift. And he was like, okay, cool, peace, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And we left, and then like, later that night, it was like three o'clock in the morning, I guess he was still in the studio. He called, he called Erica, and Erica gave me the phone. He was, he was just like, yo, man, you got some good sh Nas never has or never will need a ghostwriter. He's legendary. His pen game is unquestionable. Now, while Jay was rising in the ranks of hip hop, it was at this point where his career began to slow down a little bit. In an article by Hip Hop DX, Jay Electronica was named the most talked about MC last year, but he was more of an urban legend than an actual rapper, according to Hip Hop DX. Despite this, Jay kept dropping music. Not a lot of music, but he dropped something. He dropped the singles Exhibit A and Exhibit C. Now, out of both of these songs, Exhibit C has to be the standout track, at least for me. The song was produced by Just Blaze and sounds like something that Jay-Z would rap on around maybe 2002 or something. I was sleeping on the train, sleeping on Lezero Lab out in the rain, without even a single slice of pizza to my name. Just Blaze produced Exhibit C. How did that track come about? We was, we, we was in the studio. We were supposed to be going to the, uh, on the Angela Yee Morning Show the next morning and we didn't want to go up there without something to bring, so we was trying to work on a record to bring, so we did Exhibit C. We did it in like 15, 20 minutes, and, but it wasn't finished. We fell asleep and we missed the show and all of that. And then the next time I heard it again was when he played it on Tony Touch. And that's the story of Exhibit C. The song feels like a classic. And even though Jay isn't rapping super fast on the song, if you listen to what he's actually saying, it's full of substance. And that's one thing Jay Electronica brings every single time he drops a track. Now, Exhibit C also made it to some charts. It was also remixed by rappers like Saigon and Joel Ortiz, proving that Jay had songs that other rappers respected. In addition, 
Jay welcomed his first daughter with Erica Badu, although the pair broke it off later that year. Now, while Jay's personal life and relationship life was changing, so was his standing with the public. He may not have realized it back then, but even though he had a huge interest from the public, some people were beginning to fall off. Now, I've heard a lot of people say that Kendrick Lamar took Jay's spot. I guess because both artists can rap about anything, they're both lyrical, so people naturally put them in the same category. Now, the one major difference between Kendrick and Jay is that Kendrick actually puts out music. Kendrick may not drop two albums a year like Drake, but he doesn't need to because the fans know that Kendrick right now is taking his time to create the perfect project. You know, when Kendrick keeps his fans waiting, we know that we are about to get something monumental. Or as Jay, he just keeps the fans waiting. And instead of dropping a song that people may appreciate after all this time, he might just drop a song that he recorded in 2004. Now, 2009 was a very interesting year because it was during this year that Currency, Mos Def, and Jay Electronica formed a group called Center Edge Territory. It all began when Currency, a native of New Orleans, stepped into Damon Dash's studio called DD-172. The DD obviously stands for Damon Dash, and the 172 stands for the address of the building in New York. While Currency was a DD-172, he met up with Jay Electronica for the first time, and they clicked. And then there was Most Def, who also knew Currency for about a day. But despite this, these three rappers bonded and began making plans to take on the hip hop game together. Most Def then came up with a name for the group. And despite being artists with several connections in the game, the group decided to avoid major labels and go independent. And they quickly began working on songs. They supposedly recorded about six songs together, and one of these songs appeared on Currency's album, Pilot Talk, in the form of The Day. Yo, the king closed his cloak, the set was over for such an excellent moment. So at this point in time, these three artists were very serious about dropping an album. However, Mos Def and Jay Electronica were not known to be present in the media all the time. They would shy away from public appearances, interviews, and it seems like those artists, specifically Mos Def and Jay Electronica, did things according to their own schedule. So it came at no surprise when the Center Edge Territory album did not come out. Now despite this, Jay kept working on his own career and kept doing performances. At this point, he didn't have a huge catalog of music, but he still had loyal fans that would go to his shows and show him support. Now it was also around this time that Jay announced that his album was gonna come out on his birthday, September 19th. This got fans hyped, waiting for his album to drop. Jay kept teasing the album all year, promising the album would blow expectations out of the water. But after teasing his fans for time and time again, Jay did not drop the album and once again his fans were disappointed. Now, even though Jay had just broken a promise, things were still looking up for the man. Because around November of 2010, he signed with Jay-Z's record label, Rock Nation. The signing took place at a very strange event that kind of looked like a club. Jay said a few things about Jay Electronica and Jay performed a few bars from Exhibit C. And at this point, you could not deny his presence because all his work was finally paying off and he was standing next to Jay-Z. Now, in terms of music releases, Jay didn't drop much in 2010. He dropped a mixtape called Victory, but apart from that, his musical releases were very sparse. Then in 2011, Diddy enters the picture. Now, the thing is, before Jay signed to Rock Nation, there was a bidding war that took place for him as an artist. Diddy was currently in the running to sign Jay, but Jay chose to sign with Rock Nation, and this supposedly upset Diddy. Diddy then posted a very ambiguous and emotional tweet on social media. And the thing is, this tweet was dropped right after Jay signed to Rock Nation, which made many people believe that Diddy was talking about Jay. The situation seemed to be so obvious that even Jay's ex-girlfriend, Erica Badu, tweeted an apology to Puff Daddy. Now, of course, Diddy didn't directly engage with Jay Electronica. He was very subliminal. But this caused Jay to finally say something to Diddy. Betrayal is a serious allegation, brother. Real talk. I ain't gonna be holding my tongue if you're gonna be out here emotional and reckless with it. <laughs> Whatever happened to congratulations, black man. I'm happy for you. Now, Diddy quickly learned what Jay was saying about him in public and decided to say something to Jay. 
Before we start the week off with rumors, I am not mad at Jay-Z. I am not mad at anyone. Jay-Z was not the friend I was referring to, to be clear. At Jay Electronica, I am proud of you. I'm happy for you. I love you. I congratulate you. I'm not mad at you. So it seems that this is all Jay needed to hear, because after this, he made peace with Diddy by tweeting the following. Thank you, black man. Now let's go. Hashtag no bassness in 2011. Let's go. Now after the signing, Jay began a ridiculously long and overly delayed quest to never release his debut album. And the fans were beginning to notice a trend. So check this out. Before he signed to Jay-Z, Jay announced on Shade 45 that he would be dropping his debut album, Act 2, on Christmas Day. For context, this was just after Exhibit C dropped and took off. So at this point, he was clearly trying to ride the wave of that one track. But nonetheless, Just Blaze shot down the release date on Twitter, and the fans were once again waiting for Jay's debut album to drop. Fast forward to almost a year later, Jay announces that the album is coming out on his birthday. And on November 12th, Jay announced that he was signing to Jay-Z and Rock Nation. Then, just days later, Jay dropped the announcement and his collaboration with the legend, Jay-Z, on Shiny Suit Theory. This manila envelope, the results of my insanity. Crack set across the line to real life and fantasy. He also collaborated with J. Cole, Most Def, and Reflection Eternal. Nonetheless, Jay kept the excitement going for his new album. And around March of 2011, a video dropped on YouTube titled The Making of Act 2, which saw Jay recording music in Johannesburg, South Africa. After this, fans went crazy, speculating when the album would drop. And around July of 2011, Jay took to Twitter to announce that his album was finally done. According to him, Erica Badu heard it, so did Bun B, and so did Jay-Z. He also shared his desire to drop a song called Road to Perdition, which features Jay-Z. During this time, he dropped another memorable verse on Built's Close Your Eyes with Lucy Liu, but once again the single missed the charts. Have you ever had that feeling like you've been falling for weeks in a well? I was on the verge of dying like E.T. in the ball spot of the forest right next to the speaker's bell. Now this is unfortunately where the album seemed to stall. Every time someone on his team was asked to speak about the project, they would completely dodge the question and eventually people began to wonder whether the album was going to come out or not. So, by March of 2012, there was news that Jay-Z had the complete Jay Electro album and that it was his favorite album of 2012, however it lacked a single. Now this kind of reminds me of what happened to J. Cole when he was entering the game. When J. Cole came in, he dropped a lot of mixtapes and people were feeling his sound, but he was not exactly making commercially viable songs. Then, when it came time to drop his debut album, he felt the pressure from Jay to create a hot single, and in doing so, he came up with the song Work Out. Now, don't get me wrong, this is a very hot song, but even J. Cole says it himself that he forced it, and he was simply doing it to get radio play. I'm like cooking up for months and months trying like man and I finally get something I'm like yo this is gonna kill I'm like ecstatic about this record because right. I feel like I finally beat the game you know what I mean and that was workout <laughs> so I get a release day and we dropped the single it was the worst response on any song I've ever you gotta understand that like to my fan base it's like yo that's the chosen one right. so when they heard that song it threw them off to add insult to injury that being the worst response ever I get a call from No ID, and not only was he just like, man, why did y'all go with that? He was like, man, I'm gonna tell you the truth. I was with Nas, man, and Nas was talking about you, man. Like, why did he do that? When he told me that, it hurt. Now, let's look at someone like Jay Electro, who is known to be very rugged, underground, and lyrical. Do you see someone like that dropping a song like Work Out? Probably not. And that's the thing. Jay Electro is not the type of guy that compromises his sound to please the public. This hurts him because without dropping a commercial song, he's reducing his visibility in the public. But it also helps him because the fans believe he's staying true to his sound. So yes, 
I can see Jay's album being delayed because it didn't have a hot single because J. Cole was also in a very similar position. I got an Ox Coy story too. Yeah, yeah what was that? Real quick, 2011, I was in London for Gumball. I'm yeah. in the club. It's like 12 at night. And I get a DM on Twitter from Jay Electronic. He's no, like, uh, he's like you, you in town. Put the mic down. He's like, you in town. I'm like, yeah, I'm in town. He's like, yo, I'm going to the studio later. Why don't you come and meet me? And I was like, cool. He said, all right, so I'm having the car is going to come and pick you up about five o'clock. I'm like, in the morning? Yeah. He's like, yeah. So the car comes and pick me up in London. We go out to Surrey. It takes about an hour to get there. English countryside. I pull up to the studio, this building. I'm sitting in the car for like 20 minutes. He pulls up. About six fifteen, six twenty, we go in, and he's like, "Let's just watch the sunrise, OG." Right, and it's the the it's Phil Collins' old studio, and it's on a farm. So he's like, "You see goats and cows and shit." I'm gonna need a shot. Around, right? and then, I need some wine or something. And then, and then we prayed, and then he played me an entire album. This is in 2011. Yeah, he played me an entire album. And I'm sitting there, I'm like getting overwhelmed by all this music and I'm dead tired because I ain't went to sleep. And I got to be back in London in the car ready to drive at 10 o'clock. So he was like, what you think, OG? I said, man, listen, and I'll be honest, it was some of the greatest music I'd ever of heard. Of course like, it was. At the time. And he was like, which one you want to rap on? I said, man, I ain't even got that. I'm not even in the, <laughs> I'm not even in the frame of mind. The band went for real. <laughs> and I said, I'll be honest, I don't know which one of these motherfuckers need me. Like all of this music yeah. is amazing. Now in 2012, Jay-Z himself spoke about the situation and according to him the album was incomplete and Jay Electro was doing things according to his own time. I love that. I want to support that sort of energy. I want people to be creative and not traditional. Not just a single at this time, this time and this time. You know, he operates at his own time but the album is really close. It's exactly what it should be. It's amazing. Him as a lyricist is almost scary. He's scary good. Meanwhile, Jay became the center of yet another, and this time far bigger, celebrity scandal. Chains began to wag, and rumors started flying after the Daily Mail reported that Kate Goldsmith, a Rothschild, and her husband Ben Goldsmith were actually getting a divorce over an alleged affair between Kate and Jay Electronica. Allegedly, Ben found explicit texts and emails between Kate and Jay. This is what Ben had to say about the matter. She, Kate, is obsessed with this chap called Jay Electronica, who is one of her clients. She's always on the phone to him and out with him until 4 or 5 in the morning most nights. Sometimes she even stays with him. Now they were very bold about their affection for one another and many assumed that they were just friends. Around May of 2012, Jay tweeted, at Kate Roundtable at Watch the Helicopter Tour. And this tweet was accompanied by a photo of Kate in a helicopter, in which she retweeted, nothing too scandalous. Now apparently, the pair had known each other for years and Kate was actually involved in the music industry. Kate was a producer and later became the owner of Roundtable Records, a label she set up around 2010 and signed Jay to. After this, their relationship evolved and allegedly the affair lasted at least a year before Ben found out. Kate then split from her husband and she went on to say very disparaging things about him on social media. As for Jay Electro, she went on to praise him by saying, As for Jay Electronica, he saved my life in many ways and I am eternally grateful to him and hope that I can repay him by helping him as his manager and friend. I won't lie, the first time I heard about Jay and a Rothschild, I was like, Jay must be packing a lot of material in boxes each time he moves, if you know what I mean. Because how the hell did he get a Rothschild without even dropping an album? Bro, that's some sorcery right there. So after the divorce between Kate and Ben, the love between Jay Electro and Kate grew even more. Jay eventually moved out to England to be closer to her. And this is probably another reason why his album got delayed. You know, instead of tearing down the charts, Jay was too busy tearing down marriages. He got to rub shoulders with the elite of the banking world. But that only lasted for about two years and then he broke up with Kate. So in a way, it's almost like Jay used her for her connections and she used him to install new pipes in her sewage system. Now, according to the couple, the reason why they broke up is because they were incompatible. 
Kate was an heiress with three small children while Jay had spent years as a nomad and had been signed to a major label for four years without dropping an album. They were just on two opposite ends of the spectrum. And after a while, Jay returned to the US and eventually their relationship crumbled. Now around 2012, shortly after his affair with Kate went public, Jay took to Twitter to post the tracklist of his upcoming album. The album was set to feature Jay-Z, as well as two tracks with Kanye and even one with Diddy. Unfortunately, Jay Electra quickly deleted the post and for a short while, he stopped promoting his album. However, about a month later, while performing at Jay-Z's Made in America festival, Jay Electro announced that his upcoming album was in the mixing stages and that his first single would feature Chris Brown. Now if Chris Brown was on Jay Electronica's single, then it's clear that Jay Electronica was trying to make a song that impacts the radio. Now in an attempt to appease his fan base, Jay dropped another compilation album titled What the F*** is a Jay Electronica? Now at this point in his career, Jay Electro had made headlines time and time again, but it wasn't around till 2013 that he truly caught the attention of the public. First of all, Jay Electro had a song with Mac Miller. He appeared in the song Suplexes Inside of Complexes and Duplexes. My milk and honey, my Cherie, Cherie Amore, my Cinderella in her carriage by the doorway. However, it was his verse in Big Sean's control that truly shook the hip hop world. Or did it? And that goes for Jamaica, Big Crit Wale, Pusha T, Meek Mills, ASAP Rocky, Drake. If you listen to the song, Jay Electro had a very dope verse on it. He was dropping bars that would usually go over people's heads, and they did. However, even though Jay Electro dropped a very dope verse on the song, he could not compete with Kendrick calling out every rapper. It was at this point that people began to believe that Kendrick stole Jay's spot. But let's be real, Jay was not even fighting for that spot to begin with. Now when I heard Control for the first time, I was blown away by Kendrick's verse. Like I always knew Kendrick was talented, but I did not expect him to go at other MCs like that. So when he did, I was like, wow, Kendrick is here not to play any games. I'm like a fairly soft spring, I'm the king of New York, king of the coast, one hand I juggle them both. Now, Big Sean did his thing on the song too, and if you've been paying attention to Big Sean's music over the years, you can tell that this is one of his best verses ever. However, Kendrick's verse was just too fierce, and his delivery was just too aggressive for anybody to stand next to him. Which brings me to Jay Electro. Now I won't lie, the first time I heard this song, I didn't even know Jay Electro was on it. Like I would stop the song right after Kendrick's verse, rewind it, play Big Sean's part and Kendrick's part and that's it. Now I've spoken to a lot of people about this and they had the same experience as me. Even though Jay Electro dropped one of his best verses in his career, not a lot of people remember that Jay was on the song to begin with. Now around July of 2013, Jay Electro got his fans heated up once again because after Jay-Z dropped Magna Carta Holy Grail, Jay Electro tweeted the following. Okay, now it's my turn, let's go. The next day he tweeted the title of the album, Act 2, The Patents of Nobility, The Turn. About two months later, Just Blaze went on to talk about the album, and this time he said the album was almost done. Jay's just in his zone, and he's gonna do it when he's ready. I feel like the album needs a slight bit more touching up, just in terms of like, not that it needs more songs, the reality of it is, there's like a couple of songs that maybe he needs to do a verse over on. Maybe a song or two that needs maybe a string arrangement or something. But for the most part, the core of the album is there. It's pretty much done. Now I've been paying attention to this hip hop thing for a while. And I've noticed that whenever an artist is not dropping their album, it's not because the album is not done. Sometimes it is. But rappers usually get their album delayed because the current climate won't receive their music. Maybe Rock Nation thought that if they dropped a Jay Electro album without enough buzz, it would flop. Because let's be real, if the numbers showed that Jay Electro was about to sell 1 million copies in the first week, his album would have come out a long time ago, bad singles and all. So in my opinion, the reason why his album was delayed was because the climate was focusing on Drake, Kendrick, Cole, Meek Mill, Rick Ross, and the lane that Jay Electro occupied was taken by Kendrick and Cole. 
So as 2013 came to a close, Jay Electra remained in the shadows and his legacy was becoming defined by what he had not done as opposed to what he was doing for hip hop. So in 2014, Jay Electro said some crazy things, but we'll get to that in a moment. So in this year, Jay Electro got his fans hyped once again by promising to drop an album on July 12th. According to him, he was going to burst the heavens open and drop a magical album. But guess what? The album did not arrive. Now when I said that Jay Electro said some crazy things, this is what he had to say. According to him, he had the best verse in control and not Kendrick. In fact, according to him, his verse came first, followed by Big Sean and followed by Kendrick. Jay Electro firmly said that he was not beefing with Kendrick. However, he believes his verse had more substance than Kendrick's. And look, you know, Jay Electro might be right. He might have the best verse on the song, but seeing as most people stop listening to the song after Kendrick's verse, even if he did have the best verse, most people will never know. So around March of that year, Electronica teamed up with Jay-Z to drop a freestyle called We Made It. And this beat was used for Drake's joint of the same name. The devil, the haters, the bloggers, the papers, the labels, they label me. Jay Electro spoke about slavery, black history, and his verses were also laced with nods to the Nation of Islam and the 5% Nation. Jay Electro even called himself the Farrakhan of rap. So clearly, even without the album coming out, Jay Electro felt like he was one of the top dogs in the rap game. Then around July, Jay Electro finally told the public about why his album was not coming out. While he was at the Brooklyn Hip Hop Festival, he got a reel about his struggles. And he said that drug use threw a wrench in his career. So at this moment, it became very clear that Jay Electronica was battling demons. And that's why his album was delayed time and time again. Now I do realize this was a huge struggle that Jay Electro was going through, but it does make me draw comparisons to other rappers. Like whenever a rapper is going through a drug phase, it usually happens after they make it or after they drop their debut album. A rapper will drop one solid classic album and then get on drugs, but because they know they have hits, their core fans will always be there. With Jay Electro, it happened the other way around. He got on drugs before he dropped his monumental album. And to me, that's just working backwards. Jay Electro then dropped a song called Better In Tune With The Infinite and this was posted on his SoundCloud. My feet might fail me, my heart might ail me, the synagogues of Satan might accuse and jail me. So this year wasn't very big for Jay Electro. He somehow managed to keep himself in the conversations of the hip hop audience. But as time went on, he was slowly starting to lose their patience and their watchful eyes. Um, real quick content, mm -hmm. just really quick, really quick. Jay Electronica, is he gonna really <laughs> drop his album? <laughs> <laughs> so 2015 found Jay Electro in Nigeria, reconnecting with his heritage and exploring collaborations with local artists. And then by summer, Jay Electro was at it again. During one of his shows in London, Jay made a very audacious claim and called himself the god of hip hop. He also went on to challenge his contemporaries like Drake and Cole. He said the following at Drake, you might be the sixth god, but I am the god. And then as far as J. Cole goes, Jay Electro said this, I'm sorry, but J. Cole don't got bars like this. Now I understand what Jay Electro was trying to do. He was trying to do that 50 how to rob thing and put himself in the conversation with his peers. I snatched Kim, tell Puff, you wanna see her again? Then your ass down to the nearest ATM. However, in my opinion, Drake and J. Cole were light years ahead of Jay Electro. And that's simply because they were actually dropping projects nearly every year. Whereas Jay Electro was talking about that one album that he was going to drop, that one album that would change the game. But where was it? So to me, it makes no sense as to why Jay Electro would even think about going at Drake and J. Cole. Does Jay's music have more substance than Drake's? Yes, but what's the point of creating art if nobody's going to see it? Now around late 2015, Just Blaze got to talk about the album once again, and he told the fans that he had no updates on the project. However, he did have an almost completed version of the album on his phone. By October of 2015, it was beginning to feel like fans may never hear new music from Jay. And then, 
During a performance one night in New York, Jay jokingly said that he was going to scrap the album. I was just backstage talking about that with Jason Goldwatch. We were talking about the delete button. Now this news confused a lot of people because was Jay really about to throw away 5 years of work? Just to start again? And if he did start over, how many more years would that album take? Another 5? Another 10? How much more waiting did the fans have to do? So 2015 was not that monumental for Jay, so he decided to stir up some drama amongst his peers. Around February of 2016, Jay decided to broadcast live via Periscope and he had some choice words for Kendrick and 50 Cent. About 50 he said, 50 Cent at once, he was a good rapper, right now he got the potential to be a rapper but he's on some sucker shit and we will slap 50 Cent's eyeballs loose out his scalp. Now while he was on live, one of Jay Electro's fans asked Jay to play some Kendrick music in the car. And this caused Jay Electro to go on a mini tirade against Kendrick. To put it bluntly, he said F that. Kendrick would tell you himself he could not body me. Kendrick is my son. Kendrick is my baby. Kendrick wishes he could be me. Now I could say a lot about this, but let me just compare this to the guy who plays Home Alone, Macaulay Culkin. Now when Macaulay Culkin was growing up, he was sort of pressured into acting by his father who wanted to be an actor himself. So his father was essentially a failed actor that could not realize his full potential. So when Macaulay Culkin made Home Alone, he became one of the biggest stars in the world and ultimately became even bigger than his father. So if Kendrick is Jay Electro's son, Kendrick is Macaulay Culkin, and Jay Electro is the father that wanted the top spot but could never make it. Like his son, Kit started off as a child actor. Unfortunately, that's as far as he ever got because his plans to be a famous actor never materialized. Macaulay actually admitted that this was a huge cause of his dad's awful behavior. He explained, Everything he tried to do in life, I excelled at before I was 10 years old. Then Jay Electra went on to talk about Kendrick's control once more and said that even though people were hyped about Kendrick's verse, Kendrick didn't really say anything throughout it. Now while Kendrick did not immediately comment, 50, who's never one to shy away from a beef, threw some shade on IG and claimed he didn't even know who Jay Electro was. Now at this point, Kendrick did not need to say anything. He stood up and brought home 5 Grammys. But Jay was hell bent on war and he dropped the track, hashtag TBE, the curse of Mayweather, taking shots again at both 50 and Kendrick. This is blasphemy, James. This is blasphemy. I gave that little cockroach life and he blasted me. Niggas made all those memes and he laughed at me. Now those lines were directed at 50. He also said, He's got 11 Grammy nominations. Y'all not equal. Nah. So clearly Jay Electro was very salty because this is a very strange flex. Because remember when Jay Electro was going to sign to Rock Nation? And then Diddy said something about it. Jay Electro was quoted as saying, What happened to congratulations black man? I'm happy for you. In addition to the song, Jay also tweeted the following message. Ain't nobody safe no more. Either you with me or against me. At 50 cent, don't lie to the people. You know me. Don't make me expose you as a coward. Then about a month later, Kendrick quietly dissed Jay Electro on a Swiss Beats track. On Untitled 07, 2014 to 2016, Kendrick raps. Before you step out of line and dance with the star, I can never end a career if it never starts. So with these bars, Kendrick pointed out the obvious. It seems like Jay Electro had a lot of potential, but his career was not really taking shape. So eventually this little tension between Kendrick and Jay Electro faded away, and Jay Electro eventually apologized for his remarks. But it seems like Jay Electro was not done with TDE just yet because eventually Jay was hit by another bar, this time by Ab Soul on the album Do What Thou Wilt. Ab Soul takes shots at Jay on the track Raw. Just like a shrami of Jay Electronica until he figured Dizzle wouldn't admit that he would body him for a milli. According to Ab Soul, this is why he dissed Jay. Jay Electronica made some remarks that bothered me a lot. I told Kendrick immediately he was about to go up and get his Grammys. It was a big time for us all and for Jay to come out and do that at that time. That really rubbed me the wrong way so I spoke on it immediately. I know he put out a public apology as well so I know he knows why I said what I said. That's one of the black gods so it's still peace. 
Now the beef did not escalate past that point and eventually the topic blew over on its own. Just like that, the fans were back to waiting for J Electro's debut album. So around 2017, there was more talk about this album and Jay-Z put J Electro on the spot in front of thousands of fans. While hosting a Tidal show in New Orleans, Jay announced in front of a bunch of fans that it was time to put out the album. But guess what? It didn't come out. Jay went on to say, an album is a false concept anyway. An album is something that was created by corporations as a product to make money. That could have been my answer. J. Cole, you know, obviously. I would yes, think. very dope. And um, J. Electronica. <laughs> very, very dope too. He said he's up next. So. We're waiting. That's like detox. Let's hope not. <laughs> when Jay was directly asked about when his album would drop, there were times when he became aggressive and you could tell that he was tired of people asking him that question. Now I won't lie, this is around the time that Jay Electro began to lose me as a fan. I know that some rappers might be very critical of their work and they want to make sure that it's perfect before they put it out. But there's no way an album should take longer than a year to create unless you're trying to make a classic. But even then, if you're someone like Kendrick, you can take a year off because people know the product is gonna be quality when it comes out. Jay on the other hand had not proven anything. So making his fans wait this long for a project that may or may not be hot, it just sounds crazy to me. Crazy. So in this year, he dropped a rare single called Letter to Felon. And then in 2018, Jay began to stir the pot of drama once again. So in 2018, Eminem dropped Kill Shot, which was one of the best diss tracks of the 2010s. Eminem proved that even at 50 years old, he could still take on younger opponents. He demolished MGK with that verse, but for some reason, Jay took offense. Remember that line where Eminem accuses Diddy of taking out Pac? Let's just say Jay Electro did not like this. Eminem, how dare you accuse Diddy of killing Tupac while you completely look past Jimmy Iovine and those who profited from his death the most. You best tread carefully, son, before I come to tear your ivory tower down like Suleiman done the Templar Knights. Now, M did not really respond to Jay Electro. I mean, why respond to someone who has no album, right? But even though M was not offended, Royce the 5'9 took offense to this and had some choice words for Jay Electro on social media. I dare one of you to write something. I'ma light your ass up like a jack on a lantern. Mind your business. Now, even though he didn't mention Jay by name, it's clear that Royce was talking about him. After this, Jay deleted his Twitter. And after this, he went back to working on his album. So around 2018, Jay dropped another single. This time it was another version of Shiny Suit Theory. It featured Jay-Z and The Dream and was supposed to be the leading single off his debut album. It takes a lot to shock us, but you being so prosperous is preposterous. Now the single didn't chart, but he also featured on Pooh Bear's Hard to Face Reality with Justin Bieber as well as Rosie Lowe's The Way around 2019. Neither song was successful. So 2019 was pretty similar to other years. He promised that he would drop an album. In fact, this time he said he would drop one with Jay-Z. In fact, when he announced his album with Jay-Z, I'm sure most people were like, this album is never gonna come out. So I'm not gonna pay any attention to this. At least that's how I was thinking. Also during this year, Nas bigged Jay Electronica up and said that he wanted to work with him. And that goes to show you that even though Jay Electronica was not dropping much music, he was still respected in the genre. Jay Electronica hit me, he was like, yo, I actually wrote with Nas before. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? When I said Nas over Jay Electronica. And then came 2020. And 2020 was a very good year for Jay Electronica. On March 13th, 2020, Jay finally dropped his debut album titled A Written Testimony. The album was announced just a month before on Twitter and he revealed that it took him 40 days to record it. That's why I built my temple like Solomon in the desert. Uh -huh. The Lord is my rock, I speed down through a lot. And I won't lie, when he said this, I was like, okay, it took you 40 days to record this album. But seeing as you've been keeping us waiting for about 10 years and there are about 365 days in the year, that means the fans waited more than 3,650 days for this album to come out. And it only took him 40 days to record the whole thing. And you know, I consider myself a patient man, but 
I'm not that patient. And I'm not waiting 4,000 days for an album from any artist unless they're already established like a Jay-Z, Kanye, Eminem. You know, these artists have already proven that they can drop solid albums, so their projects are worth the wait. But waiting over 10 years for a debut album to me sounds crazy. It's insane. But I won't lie, A Written Testimony is actually a very good album. It placed number 12 on the Billboard 200 and sold about 31,000 copies in the first week. Additionally, Jay-Z appears in about 7 songs. So when Jay Electronica was talking about dropping an album with Jay-Z, this is probably the album he was talking about. The album also featured The Dream and Travis Scott and was nominated for the Best Rap Album category at the 2021 Grammy Awards. Needless to say, he did not win. Now despite the half-baked success of the album, Jay actually experienced a lot of controversy after it came out. This was because Jay, a registered member of the Nation of Islam and a very strong supporter of Louis Farrakhan was accused of anti-Semitism. Also, Joe Budden went in on Jay Electronica and you could tell the man was not satisfied with the album that came out. For the last decade, y'all have mentioned Jay Elec with Hove. And Jay Elec positions himself that way on arguably one of the greatest tracks ever on Exhibit C. That is God level rhyming. Hate is my underwhelmed. For me to say I'm underwhelmed, I didn't go into it expecting anything. Jay Electronica album. All right, so you, we want to go track for track? Debatable. <laughs> yeah. Very much debatable that this Very would debatable. be. Does this count as a debut Jay Electronica Absolutely album? Absolutely not. I agree it does not count as a debut. Absolutely not. Album. Yeah, this is not a debut. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? It's not a debut. It's a debut. It's not a debut. <laughs> Problem number one, before you even get to the amazing job that Hove might have done on that verse. Problem number one for me here. If this is your debut, <laughs> you have to start it. Mm. You, I'm with you. You that's that's a rule. I'm trying to think if anybody has ever started That's a rule. This is hate. But it's rapper hate. Because when y'all move the goalposts as a rapper, I see it. And for the last decade, y'all have mentioned Jay Alec with Hove. I certainly have. I y'all. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I'm not talking to y'all. Oh, okay. <laughs> and Jay Alec positioned himself that way uh on arguably one of the greatest tracks ever with exhibit c yeah that is god level rhyming and the uh album he did with all the uh, uh, eternal um the, the eternal sunshine, sunshine yeah. Yeah. that was yes. great um jim carrey yeah that was god level rapping and yeah. commercial capitalism at his finest shouting out all of the people that all right if you got that co-sign then it supports what my ears are hearing mm -hmm. and then you disappear for a while. And we left him there. Then a fan responded to Joe Budden and said the following. Joe Budden hasn't dropped a classic in his life and he's critiquing Jay Electronica and Hove. Budden then responded to the fan by saying the following. I never got absolutely mopped around on my own project either. Jay then responded and said, I never heard your albums, bro. May Allah bless your career as a journalist. Now, for the most part, it seems like Joe Budden was upset because there was too much Jay-Z on Jay Electronica's project. So it almost felt like a collaboration album instead of a solo project. Joe then said to Jay Elec, I took you off yours and it's a Hove mixtape now. Peace be unto you as well, King. After that, Jay Elec stopped debating with Budden and simply tweeted, Make sure y'all give me my credit for lighting up that next podcast episode too. Hashtag Drake is my spirit animal. Even when he signed with Jay, I was like, why is he doing that? But all right, maybe, you know. There's not a single song by uh, There's not Just a single Blake. song the, by the Just The producers Blake. on this are Swizz Beats, Hip Boy, uh, Arab Music, Alchemist, No ID, and, and maybe, Krang Bin. Uh, I'm not familiar with that guy. But um, then when I'm hearing Jay-Z on every song, now again, Jay-Z is one of my favorite rappers. So... How do you take two of my favorite rappers, put them together, and they make something that is not crazy to me? Like, it just, I enjoyed Jay, you know, going in his conscious bag.
We hear that from time to time. But I just feel like he didn't need to be on every song. Now since then, j Lack has kept dropping music and around October of 2020, he dropped the album Act 2, Patents of Nobility, The Turn. It came out days after it was leaked and it completely missed the charts. So after 10 years of waiting for this project, it finally came out and to be honest, it largely went unnoticed. It seems like even though J Electronica fans were patiently waiting for this album, the vast majority of the public had moved on from J Lack, and that's simply because he took too long to drop a project. So what did J Lack do to make up for this? He kept dropping music. In fact, around 2021, he appeared on Kanye's album Danda on two tracks, Jesus Lord and Jesus Lord Part 2. The former track performed very well and became the peak of Jay's charting career. In that same year, he also appeared on West Side Gun's Free Cutter. Then around 2022, things got very interesting for the man. This time, Jay got into it with the controversial music manager, WAC 100. It all began when WAC was on Clubhouse, where he asked what happened to the money raised by the 1995 Million Man March. Jay then clapped back hard on Twitter, saying, Keep my nation's name out your f***ing mouth. At WAC 100, if you got questions, ask me. Don't be stunting on our little brother. Press me about the nation of Islam if you want that smoke. He also went on IG and told WAC 100 to sit down and shut his ass up. Now, of course, WAC 100 had to respond. And he said, you're nobody to ask. I asked the man in front of me at brother Ben X. And he answered the question. I've never known the nation of Islam to duck a question. That's what they're there for. To educate. Am I not right? You strike back with anger because a black man asked another black man a question to gain understanding. You're fresh out of Ramadan with this behavior, with this attitude. Poor representation of what this movement stands for. Now when Jay Electronica was not causing controversy, he was still trying to push his career. And this year he teased the release of a new album, possibly titled Bismillah Boys. As to when that album is coming out, who knows. In essence, Jay Electronica is a very dope rapper. With only a couple of songs, he was able to gain the respect of people like Nas, Jay, Diddy, and people were even calling the man a god level MC. However, I think his falling off is pretty much self-imposed. Because while his peers were dropping album after album, single after hot single, Jay was continuously talking about the album he was going to drop. And at the end of the day, he sounded like that friend who said he was going to start a business, but never does, you know? After a while, you're gonna be like, okay, I can take this guy seriously. And that's essentially what happened to Jay Lack. By pushing his album further and further away, he lost the respect of many fans. And if he had just dropped the album when he was at his peak, he would probably be a bigger artist than he is today. That being said, he's still a very good lyricist, he's still a very dope rapper, and if he drops an album, I'm probably going to listen to it. But at the same time, I'm not gonna sit around and wait for this album to come out, because as they say, life goes on. On Spotify, he has about 849,000 monthly listeners, and his most listened to songs are Fruits of the Spirit, Exhibit C, and Red. Jay. Not showing up tonight. <laughs> Jay. <laughs> They'll love me even more. <laughs> Jay Electronica is just like a very unique person. But um, yeah, it was a crazy night. But no, Jay Electronica, I just feel like, um, you know, I think as an artist, sometimes it's hard to put out projects. I feel like every time he's put out a project, he was like forced to. Even like the song Exhibit C, the way that even came out, wasn't him finishing the song and putting it out intentionally. It was just Blaze right. being like, let's let it fly, you know, and right. with Tony Touch. And so yeah. with him, I just feel like he gets inspired to do stuff when he feels like doing it. And then sometimes it's hard to share your music because of how people are. Like, whether you have a blog, whether you have a website, whether you make music, whether you're a chef, whether you're an artist, visual artist, whether you're a mechanic, stop running to these multi-billion dollar corporation, capitalist American fucks. They don't know what they're doing. The country, listen, listen, listen. If we're in a recession, if they say the state of the country is bad, then that means that the people who are in leadership positions all over the country, whether it's in art, whether it's in politics, agriculture, wherever it's in, if we're in a bad place as a country, that means that the leaders are in a bad place. They're making bad decisions. Yeah. So, I feel you. 
it's on us. It's on us to take this thing in the right direction. That's it for me, it's your boy Ali. What happened to Jay Lack in your opinion? Let me know down below. Also, add me on Instagram at Ali Talks Music till next time.